Hi, this is Julie Newmar, and you're watching Mr. Media. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Scott Tracy Griffin, the author of Tarzan, The Centennial Celebration, a fascinating and beautifully illustrated coffee table book that no fan of the Jungle Lord should be without. Stick around. You never know when I might start pounding my chest and break into my ape cry. Well, actually, it's more of an ape simper, but I'm working on it. Today's episode of Mr. Media Interviews is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. You know GoDaddy.com from their wild and sexy commercials, but isn't it time you actually test drove their web hosting and domain registration services yourself? For a limited time, Mr. Media listeners can save 10% on the already low price of web hosting services at GoDaddy.com by entering the promo code POD4 at checkout. Again, that's 10% off web hosting when you go to GoDaddy.com and enter the promo code POD4, that's P-O-D, the number 4, at checkout. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of athletic women dressed in skimpy faux animal skins in an effort to play Jane to my Tarzan in the new new media capital of the world. St. Petersburg, Florida. First things first, I may be the only grown man in America who will admit to loving the movie John Carter. Sure, the story was imperfect, the whole thing a wee bit too long, and no doubt puzzling to anyone not familiar with the origins of the original Edgar Rice Burroughs superhero. Oh, and I also think Disney erred mightily in dropping Of Mars from the title. That, that might have distinguished the title character from John Carter of accounting, let's say. But I thought the movie still kicked ass in much the same way that I thought Star Wars did the first time I saw it more than 35 years ago. So I was a good candidate to be interested in Scott Tracy Griffin's new illustrated book, Tarzan, The Centennial Celebration. It's a stunningly attractive piece of work, bringing together a century's worth of the art, films, and stories that make Burroughs one of the Western world's most remarkable creative minds. Now, in one place, you can now find the book covers and interiors by Frank Frazetta and Roy Krenkel, the comic book work of Joe Kubert, the comic strips of Hal Foster, and movie stills from all the great and, well, okay, not-so-great Tarzan films and TV. As a matter of fact, TV's Tarzan Ron Eli, who will always be Doc Savage to me, even wrote the introduction. I can't wait to learn more about this great book. Tracy Griffin, welcome. To Mr. Media. Thank you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So, this is, a, I mean, this a, really is a wonderful book, and I'm very excited to have it on my on my bookshelf. I'm actually married to a woman who likes two characters from that age. She loves Tarzan, and she loves the shadow. So she was very excited when she saw this on the table. She said, oh my god! <laughs> so, how that did sounds you... Sounds like a very compatible marriage. I, th I think we're doing okay, you know? Uh, <laughs> just about 25 years, and uh, still counting. Uh, uh -huh. But how did you get involved in this book? Well, I've been a fan since childhood, since before I could read. I was fascinated sort of with the character that was, uh, you know, running around with apes and lions and elephants and um, grew up on the novels of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Started reading when I was nine and never was without a Tarzan or John Carter or Burroughs book throughout junior high and high school. And um, so when I moved out to California right after college, I started writing for the movie magazines, trying to write about any sort of Burroughs property I could, or Mars movies, or whatever. And 
just sort of worked my way up the feeding chain, became acquainted with the folks at ERB Inc. and pitched this project to them, and they decided I was the right writer for it. Oh, excellent. Congratulations. That's very cool. And so you really have followed this love of, uh, of Burroughs. Yes, yes. Lifelong passion uh, for his writings. Uh, I have to ask, though, as a, as a teen walking around with Burroughs books, uh, I mean, it's not like walking around with, I don't know, uh, Harry Potter, let's say, uh, because it was never, it's never been quite the same thing. But, you know, was that, did you have friends who were into Burroughs or was it just you? Um, usually they would try, they would pick up a book, they would see it and they would pick one up and, and read it and say, hey, this is pretty good. But they ne- it never really took off with any of my friends, I don't think. Um, they were more one or two shot Burroughs, Burroughs readers. Um, I was really a bookworm more than my friends. You know, I, I play sports and so we were all into athletics and stuff and I was sort of the bookworm of the, the group. So what's the pitch on the book? How did you convince them that this was the way to, to do the book? Well, they had a number of of publishers that were interested in doing an illustrated history, and and my um, approach was you have to tell the story. You know, you can't just just show the images. You have to tell the story from beginning. Burroughs, you know, I start with the biography of Burroughs growing up and and how that influenced his work, and then step by step through all the novels and then the other media, and then I end with Burroughs' death. So... um, you know, that was my pitch, was that you need someone who knows the history and can tell the history from beginning to end. And um, they agreed, mm-hmm. thankfully. Now, the book came out uh, after John Carter, but was it was it all uh, tied to the Carter release at any point? Was, it, was that something you were anticipating as being helpful? Probably. Well, it was tied to the centennial, yes, yes, um, because it was a 100-year anniversary for both Tarzan and John Carter, and so Disney sort of synced John Carter up in the spring, and, um, you know, Tarzan came out, uh, the All Story magazine, in October. So that was a fall release. So I believe my first signing was October 20th, 100 years to the month after the release. Uh, I have to ask, were you disappointed by the Carter movie? No. Um, I liked it, and I think it's better on repeat viewings. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a fan. I was a little surprised that there was there was so much Thurn stuff front loaded, the big conspiracy in the plot. I understand why Stanton did it because he was envisioning a trilogy and he had to lay it out. Um, but I, I could see how it could be a little overwhelming for someone who didn't grow up with the books. It seems odd to me, and we'll talk about Tarzan. But trust me. But I mean, it always seemed odd to me that uh, people who could grasp that you know Star Wars from the first movie and into the second movie <laughs> found this too overwhelming. I just didn't see it that way but yeah i think well you know the plot like i said was a little convoluted and the 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 two red men some people had a hard time distinguishing helium from zodanga and what was going on and um you know of course those of us who know the franchise and know the property followed right along but you know even people that didn't keep up a lot of them like the action scenes and the sequences they loved uh, a lot of that stuff was you know directly from the books the thark hatchery and the babies and and sort of john carter's entry into thark society and the battle with the war hoon and um, so it had some great set pieces that were right from the book oh, the special effects were great i keep hoping that maybe uh, it'll do well in uh, somehow in dvd release and disney will go yeah. well we have all these sets we've spent all this money already maybe we can monetize it by doing another movie but Yes. Some, yes. Somehow, I think they'd get killed if, if they told their shareholders they were going to do a second one. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Well, so okay. So as you're doing this book on Burroughs, now as you were enjoying Burroughs' work uh, as you're growing up, you know, you're reading the stories. Uh, mm-hmm. Whether I don't know if did you go beyond the novels? Did you read into the comics and the the movies as well? Uh, oh yeah. I um, my mom actually wouldn't let us read comic books when I was little, and um, because she thought you know we needed to read literature. And so when I finally had my allowance, and my <clears throat> I was with my father, and he was sort of a soft touch, I managed to buy a, a Korak funny book when I was about 10. And after that, the floodgates were unleashed, and that was the DC era, DC and Marvel. Mm-hmm. So I read all those, and uh, I got Erwin Porges was my birthday present when I believe I was, for my 12th birthday, that big 800-page pa- 800 biography wow. of Burroughs. And so I had already been combing through it in the library, and... <laughs> And my mom finally, uh, you know, acquiesced and bought it for me. And I did a book report on it. And in uh, seventh grade, I lugged that thing up to the front of the room and, and <laughs> extolled Burroughs. 
Well, you certainly knew how to push the buttons, right? You, you figured yeah. out a way to get the comic book. You figured out a way to get the biography. Right, right. And and look, Mom, I I, I did a book report on it. Aren't, isn't that yes. great? Well, I don't know if, if they would have ever seen that it would have sort of eventual pro- professional repercussions. You know, they they like the fact that I re- read and it improved my vocabulary and and uh, helped me to be a writer and everything. But I don't, I don't think my parents would have seen down the road that I would write this book. But my mom's very pleased with it. I was just going to ask, does she look back now and go, oh, I get it. It all fits together. <laughs> Good for you, kid. Yeah, and, and friends on Facebook, people from high school, I guess, could kind of shake their heads and said, we, sh- you know, we saw this coming. <laughs> You're, this is exactly what we would have pictured, um, you know, because they remember me with the, the Valentine paperback in my back pocket, I guess. <laughs> great and what kind of things did you learn about Burroughs uh, uh, in your in your research that maybe wasn't in the biography or maybe that maybe because the biography I'm sure wouldn't cover <laughs> the the uh, involvement of the multimedia things like that right right um, Porsches it's interesting because he he wrote in sort of a vacuum he went into the warehouse and he you know it's it's so extensive and and the details and the minutia, minutia of Burroughs' life, but there's not a lot of outside context. So that was one thing I sought to bring to mind was to talk about the Anyoto, the Leopard Men Society, um, the dinosaurs in Africa. That you know that we still have these rumors of dinosaurs. So I sought to bring a little bit of of you know, real world cultural context to Burroughs' writing. And um, I think the the interesting thing for me was I started out re I read every novel about. 80 of them, including the short story compilations, in the order they were written as I was reading along with Porges and some of the other biographies and reference materials. So it was sort of in- interesting to to experience Burroughs' evolution of thought from this sort of young, idealistic young man. Well, he was 36, but he was still, you know, creatively young, I guess, who sort of idealized war and combat and conflict until by the end of his life when he witnessed Pearl Harbor and he became much more... Um, you know, his his war writings became much darker and beyond the farthest star and, and Tarzan and the Foreign Legion. I think that's kind of true for a lot of people. They, they, they you know, uh, particularly I think a lot of men, they, they think war is very romantic and very dramatic, right. but you get a taste of it. You lose somebody or you experience it and it's kind of, suddenly it's like, oh, that's real blood. That's real death. Right. That's real. It, maybe it's not as romantic as I thought it was from the, you know, from Hemingway and Movies right, and, right. You know, bridge over the river Kwai and what have you. Um, I, I was kind of wondering, Burroughs uh, lived. Uh, I think he passed in 1944, right? Uh, 1950. Oh, 50. 1950. Oh, I'm right. sorry. Okay. Well, even better for my question. For some reason, I thought okay. he had passed in 44. Um, what did he think? A lot of people, I think, um, were introduced to uh, uh, Tarzan and, and the other characters. Not through the novels, I think, so much as through mm-hmm. film and and the serials, uh, maybe radio, comics, mm-hmm. uh, uh, comic strips. What did he do, you, do? Do we have any sense of what he thought of the the spinoff of of his work? Well, I think the silent films and serials were sort of a baptism by fire. He had high expectations, and he was repeatedly disappointed by them. And so, by the time the talkies came along with Weissmuller, he realized it wasn't his Tarzan, but, you know, the check's still clear and <laughs> allowed him to live his lifestyle and support his family. So, he sort of had mixed feelings, I guess. He, he appreciated what they were doing and, and, you know, learned to just sort of stand back. And especially when Saul Lesser got a hold of the franchise, Saul would turn out a very profitable Tarzan movie, worldwide profitability. Even back in those days, they were making 75% of their profit overseas. Mm-hmm. So Burroughs just sort of took a hands-off approach and let Saul do his thing, and and uh, you know deposited the checks. I uh, I mention this occasionally when I'm, I'm talking about this type of thing, but I did a biography, uh, uh, authorized a biography of uh, Will Eisner, the comic book artist, a few years ago who created The Spirit, and his feeling on on seeing uh, uh, adaptations of The Spirit was always he hated it. He didn't. He never <laughs> wanted to see it. Uh, the 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 one that he saw was a TV adaptation. He thought it was cardboard, uh, and but he kept licensing his work out to them because he liked the checks. Right. He just right. never wanted to be bothered. And you know, I, I I've always maintained that if he had seen what Frank Miller did a couple of years ago to the Spirit, he probably would have stopped accepting the checks. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so I was you know I from that perspective I was very curious to know 
you know, if, if Burroughs got any enjoyment other than, you know, cash uh, from that. Well, there were some times. I think he liked, he, he really liked Elmo Lincoln as a person. Um, he thought the world of Elmo Lincoln. Um, he seemed to have warm feelings for Marino Sullivan and Johnny Weissmuller. So, you know, I think in, in that perspective, because he sort of had the human connection behind the scenes, uh, that sort of uh, assuaged his, uh, his creative uh, disgruntlement. Of course, who didn't have warm feelings for Marino Sullivan? Right. I'm sorry. Am I getting off topic here? Yeah. Um, uh, tell folks what Burroughs was like. Was he? I mean, was he somebody you would want to, you know, uh, go to the bar with and have a drink? Was he someone who would be entertaining to be with, or was he, you know, more of a private? Well, he was extremely intelligent. Of course, he didn't have a formal education past high school, and and you know, always said that he spent most of his time. Uh, doing Latin and Greek in grammar school, and he never really got a grasp of English. That was his sort of uh, self-deprecating nod to the critics of his novels. He wasn't particularly um, outgoing or um, extroverted. He was very um, self-effacing and sort of humble, and he was humorous. Um, People, you know, he was a, a very nice, generous, humorous man. But he wasn't uh, loud and boisterous or anything like that. He was a very humble man. And I think you kind of describe him as a family man, too. Yes, he always said that his proudest achievement, you know, was not his books, but but raising his three children, that they were his proudest achievement. Any of them uh, following his footsteps at all? Well, um, Holly, his oldest son, became a photographer. Um they all sort of uh, contributed to the family franchise. Joanne Burroughs was Jane on the radio program. She married Jim Pierce, who was a silent film Tarzan, and he did the voice of Tarzan on the first Tarzan radio program. And then Holly became a photographer, and they were together uh, sporadically throughout World War II. Holly was a combat photographer. Um, but I don't – well, he and, and Jim Coleman, of course, illustrated his father's stories. He was a painter. And then Jim and Holly teamed up, I believe, and wrote a few – um, pulp stories, but they never really took off. I don't think they had that that Burroughs flash. So all of the children sort of contributed, and of course they were on the board of directors and, and helped run the company too. And was he the kind of guy that you would look at and go, "Oh, sure, he te- he writes these swashbuckling tales of adventure and and uh, science fiction," or was he the kind of guy? I mean, it seemed to me, especially seeing all the pictures, and you've got great pictures in the book uh, of him at all through the ages. It doesn't really look like the kind of guy who would be telling these stories, although, you know, who, who is, maybe? No, and that's why, you know, when he wrote uh, Princess of Mars, he was scribbling it down on the backs of uh, envelopes and letterheads and whatnot, scrap paper, um, when he was bored on his day job, uh, you know, in his downtime. And he hid it from his family because he thought it was sort of a sissy profession for a big, strapping, virile, you know, he always fancied himself as this, this outdoorsman. And uh, he thought it was was not a good profession for a, a man. And I believe one of the um, interviewers talked about when he he met Burroughs, he said he had the hands of a blacksmith. He had, you know, big rugged hands, and and um, he was a rugged guy. So he definitely was not didn't come across as a feat or, um, you know, someone who who spent his time in the drawing rooms and the parlors. <laughs> Um, was was he uh, was he likable? Was he you know? Uh, and was he respected in his time? That's I think I kind of wonder about that. Well, I think certainly his his uh, you know from a commercial perspective he was respected. Um, creatively, you know that sort of fiction has always been dismissed. Popular fiction and pulp fiction and and you know even today people love Stephen King and John Grisham, but but. You know, they don't consider them on par with Pulitzer Prize winning authors. Right. Um, so he was, you know, there was there was a sense, some, in some respects, his work and his genre was sort of marginalized and, and sidelined. But, you know, New York Times and uh, Saturday Evening Post and others, of course, did articles on his incredible uh, profitability and the fact that he did create, you know, an icon, uh, one man out of his genius, um, created an icon. Tarzan came from one man, not a team of writers or a syndicate or anything else. Um, I want to come back to the uh, the idea of other the spin-offs. Uh, 
Uh, and I, I kind of wondered if, if you were going to introduce someone to Tarzan of the Apes uh, for the first time, let's say they've been living under <laughs> a rock, which we know a lot of people are living under rocks these days, right. uh, and they didn't know Tarzan, what would be the best way in? Would it be through the novels? Would it be through film? You know, how, how would you want to introduce someone to get them to want to know more and read more or know more? Tarzan of the Apes. It was the very first Tarzan novel, and it was Burroughs' third novel. I think he hit his peak there. I think that was his best novel. Um, it has a very lyrical quality. I actually just had uh, a, a colleague who's a writer um, who I've worked with for years and has sort of you know, gotten the Burroughs from osmosis through me and has seen films and so forth with me. And, and she finally read it, and she said, you know, this is wonderful, the writing's so lyrical, and she really liked it after... Um, sort of years of dismissing it and, and not really. So definitely Tarzan of the Apes, that, that gives you, you know, the origin story. It gives you Burroughs' initial concept, and it's some of Burroughs' best writing, I think. Mm. And uh, the other thing I was wondering is after reading this book, uh, I'm sorry, after publishing the book, having written the book, mm -hmm. um, you obviously, and, and now I know, you, you know, a lifetime of, of loving the work of Burroughs, right. uh, you're, you're clearly an expert on Edgar Rice Burroughs, and I wondered what what parts of his creative output might still be ripe for further mining by either publishers or film producers or electronic media today? What do you think you know, might sell or bring a new generation of interest? Well, that's a good question because so much of his, his uh, writing has been cherry-picked. You know, the whole John Carter series, you see the influence of that in Star Wars and Avatar and, and Flash Gordon and every other franchise. So much of his work got cherry-picked. Um, I think his Apache novels are very well done. They're, they're um, told from the Apache point of view and sort of the waning era of that, uh, you know, of the, of the uh, Apache Indian. And um, that they are very well done. And he has a lot of cultural stuff about the Apache. Of course, he was in the cavalry, and I don't think he had direct conflicts with uh, the Apaches. There were some, some outlaw renegades running around stirring up trouble. But uh, he did, you know, would would uh, sit and drink with their, their Apache scout and, and hear his stories of the way life was. So definitely the Apache novels. I would love to see further development across all media of the John Carter franchise. Um, Carson Venus is fun, um, but it's a little different. You know, Carson's sort of an everyman hero. He's kind of a bumbler. Mm -hmm. um, Burroughs was, in some sense, sort of spoofing himself towards the end after after the Carter series. And, uh, of course, anything with dinosaurs, Land at Time for God and... and um, the Pellucidar series. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff there that that's ripe for development, I think, and, and redevelopment. We've we've seen a little bit with the land that time forgotten, the the At the Earth's core, those B movies in the seventies, but yeah, they'd really do well to to use the current CGI technology and, and make an extravaganza of these these fantastic films. And what's going on at ERB Inc.? Are they are they aggressively uh, licensing? Are they sitting back? Yes. Yes, they had sort of a fallow period. You know, they had the uh, centennial of Burr's birth in 75, and we saw a tremendous amount of product then. And then it sort of tapered off. You know, they were, they were you know, readying Greystoke, and this was going to be their big serious approach. And, um, and there was a little flurry of stuff with Greystoke, not as much marketing. But now the, there's a, a new administration as of about three or four years ago, and they've really, you know, they put a lot of, of great stuff out for the, um, Centennial, Robin Maxwell wrote the Jane story from Jane's point of view, you know, meeting Tarzan, this young woman who goes into the jungle. It's the first oh, woman. Oh, my lord, I have the papers. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think her Jane is a little more feminist than that. Yeah, I um, figured. <laughs> and Andy Briggs is writing Tarzan novels for teens. He's a, a British based uh, writer. Uh -huh. And of course, we've got two movies in development the, the CGI. Um, um, motion capture movie and the live action that Warner Brothers is developing. So, yeah, there's there's uh, a number of things in the pipeline. I got you know I was just thinking as you said that I'm remembering that uh, D uh, Disney did a Tarzan animated film that was actually pretty good a while back. Yes, I think it was the you know the Disney Renaissance of the '90s. They produced ten or eleven films with you know the the uh, cutting edge technology, and I believe Tarzan is the third most profitable, right behind Beauty and the Beast. And if they'll re-release Tarzan. It might jump, you know, behind Lion King, which of course was a worldwide phenomenon. Nobody's going to catch the Lion King in 
in terms of animated movies, but Tarzan's close close to second for Disney. Well, that Tarzan film, I'm just remembering now as we're talking, the animated Tarzan film was actually, it was very well drawn, very, very, it had a very nice style, and maybe if they, you know, they added the 3D to it, it might be, uh, it'd probably yes, be pretty yes. cool to see, you know, Tarzan swinging through the jungle. and. Yeah, they had that, that deep canvas technology, which, yeah. um, you know, they had the 2D sort of overlaid the um, the deep canvas, which gave it, you know, at the time of three dimensional. So I think, yeah, if they could figure out some way to separate that and and three D that, it would be even more impressive. All right. Well, so uh, quickly before we go, uh, just a couple of quick questions: mm -hmm. uh, best Tarzan, worst Tarzan? In terms of uh, films or adaptation? Uh, let's go with the films first. The, uh, uh, the, the best Tarzan actor. actor, I guess, is what I'm what I'm wondering. Well, you know, Johnny Weissmuller, I think, had the charisma and uh, and his relationship with Marino Salva. And I think he's unsurpassed. There have been some other ones. I sort of tend to skew towards the ones who, the men who played him as intelligent and articulate, like Herman Bricks and Ron Ely. Um, I like their interpretation because it was a little closer to the Burroughs of of uh, the Tarzan of Burroughs novels. And um, I grew up on, and, and probably the closest thing to Burroughs novels was the filmation television series of the 1970s. I grew up watching that. And I believe they're preparing that for re-release. So that's really exciting. There were, you know, about 30-something episodes of that that often, you know, adapted the novels and uh, were very fun. Hmm. And, uh, well, okay, so what about of the novels, the Tarzan novels? Best novel, worst novel? Tarzan of the Apes, I would say, is the best one. Um, also, I like Tarzan the Terrible, which has dinosaurs and the lost land of Palo Alto and, you know, just fantastic this fantastic lost prehistoric land in the middle of an African swamp. Um, so those would be my top two. Probably the least favorite would be um, Tarzan in the Forbidden City, which was adapted from a radio script and which was also adapted as a newspaper strip and a mm -hmm. comic. And, and, you know, it just kept getting recycled, the, the script for that one, and Bros fleshed it out. And it's, it's a little quirky... Um, uh, but I, I like all of them. I, you know, I enjoy Tarzan and the Forbidden City. It's, it's not as, as well written as Tarzan of the Apes, but I, I like them all. And the comic book series? Uh, did you ever have you have you since uh, since growing up? Have you read them all now? Do you have an opinion on which one? Yes, done yes. Well? I really love the work of Russ Manning, um, especially his newspaper strips. The newspaper strips were a little more sophisticated than the the comic books. When you read them, a lot of times there's there's sort of a dark subtext to them or, you know, the, the women are, are always about to be ravaged by some beast man or something, <laughs> you know, things they wouldn't show in the comics. And um, so I love the Russ Manning newspaper comics. And, of course, he wrote for the comic strips. Another artist I really like, his approach is Thomas Yates. Um, for Dark Horse a few years ago, he did a, an adaptation of the, the last half of Return of Tars in the Jungle sequence. And that's probably the best adaptation of a Burroughs novel. Very faithful, and, you know. And Tom, you know, gave them all the hairstyles of the period, and and uh, just terrifically researched and presented. So Thomas Yates and Russ Manning, I, say, I would say, are two. And and Russ is in reprints now, so they're two that that I think people should should seek out and read. And uh, I'm not going to compare it to anyone because I don't think you can compare Frank Frazetta to anyone. But uh, did you like the Frazetta work, or was it off? Uh I did. Um, I picked up uh, my first books were the Neil Adams and Boris Vallejo. Mm. So, and um, I liked. I think I liked Boris a little more when I was a kid. But as an adult, I've I've gotten a, a greater appreciation for Neil Adams. And um, so, yeah, I love the Frazetta. Um, Neil and Neil Adams and Boris were the the artists of my childhood. So I think they. Uh, I have a little stronger emotional connection to those books. You know, I walked into a bookstore looking for a Tarzan book at age nine, and there they were out on a rack. You know, they had them all, the whole set. And, you know, I, I remember staring mesmerized, and I couldn't decide which one of the covers. And finally, I went with number one because I wanted to see, you know, how the story began, and I didn't want to jump into the middle. So, yeah, it was a very tough choice, but... Um, you know, that, that's the thing is the franchise, you know, it's fortunate that they've had the best pop culture artists of the century, you know, illustrating it. And Joe Jesco is, has done some tremendous work and is, is working now on some commissions for the Burroughs people. So, um, yeah, there's just so much art, you know, to choose from. It, it, how can you pick a favorite? Mm, understood. Well, uh, last question, I guess. Uh, what's next for you? Is, is there more Tarzan and Burroughs work for you? Or are you moving on to something else at this point? What? 
Um, it depends. I would like to do something with the John Carter franchise. Um, maybe a similar treatment or the rest of Burroughs, you know, all of his, his books just depends on, you know, what the publishers say and, and, you know, what the market is. Uh, if I revisit Tarzan, it would probably be the, the newspaper strips, the Sunday strips and the daily strips. I'd like to look at those in depth and, and get some of the, the great work by people like Bob Lubbers and, and, um, other people that's, that hasn't been reprinted and deserves to be reprinted. Um, if I could help facilitate that, that would be, you know, that would make me very happy. Well, you're with the right publisher. They just did a beautiful job with the Flash Gordon, uh, reprinting Flash mm -hmm. Gordon strips. So I hope that'll happen. That'd be fun to see. Um, yes. Well, uh, folks, listen, you can find Tarzan, the Centennial Celebration, uh, the new book by Scott Tracy Griffin, in great bookstores everywhere. Or order it right now at a great price at MrMedia.com. Uh, if, you if you're watching on video uh, on MrMedia.com, right below the video, you should see the image of the cover. And you can just click on it right this minute, right now, and order the book, and it'll be yours at a great price. Uh, uh, Tracy, uh, website, uh, Twitter, Facebook, can we find you online? Uh, Facebook. I'm on Facebook, so if people want uh, to send me a message or, or, you know, give me some feedback or whatever, uh, I'm always open to that. All right. That'd be great. And uh, uh, Tr Scott Tracy Griffin, uh, author of uh, Tarzan, the Centennial Celebration. Thanks so much for being with us in Mr. Media. It was a fun book. Good interview. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. My pleasure. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's The Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The TechCrunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, Blackberry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash mrmedia. That's stitcher.com slash mrmedia. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party... Please consider calling 1 800 Dial DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1 800 Dial DJs or go to their website, 1 800 Dial DJs.com, and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening. Today's episode of Mr. Media Interviews is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. You know GoDaddy.com from their wild and sexy commercials, but isn't it time you actually test drove their web hosting and domain registration services yourself? 
For a limited time, Mr. Media listeners can save 10% on the already low price of web hosting services at GoDaddy.com by entering the promo code POD4 at checkout. Again, that's 10% off web hosting when you go to GoDaddy.com and enter the promo code POD4, that's P-O-D, the number 4, at checkout. 